So to start, um, there's a term that I don't know if you guys are using this term or if you've seen it or discussing it in class yet at all, but the term digital transformation is, is a pretty buzzy term right now um, that's used by a lot of consultants, industry analysts. And it's, in my opinion, it's, it's sort of a catch-all bucket of all sorts of technology that is any sort of technology that's going to help automate a business. So it could be ERP, which is enterprise resource planning, which is, is more your, you know, the core financial and accounting software and inventory management and the, the kind of the base core of how uh, a company tracks its, its finances and its, and its inventory and whatnot. So ERP is oftentimes um, viewed as, as, a, as a core technology that the businesses use. But in addition to ERP, you also have all these other different technologies that can help automate different parts of a business. So you have things like customer relationship management or CRM, which is more uh, automation for a sales team. So it's a way to capture uh, opportunities that a sales team might be pursuing. It's a way to uh, centralize that information about the touch points that the sales reps are having with their, their potential customers. It helps them price and quote things and keeps track so that a company can enforce some consistency and standards and how they sell. So CRM is another type of technology. And then you also have human capital management is another common technology that the companies use for their HR departments. So if you think about when you apply for a job from the moment you send in your resume until you get interviewed and then you eventually get hired and then you get performance reviews, you're getting ongoing training, you, you eventually leave, either you, you resign or you get fired, whatever the case may be, hopefully maybe you get fired, but um, you, the, the HR technology is a way to track that whole process for employees. And that's a, a super manual process historically, but HCM technology today is, has provided some ways to, to automate those processes. And the whole idea here is that when every company's definition of digital transformation is probably going to vary a bit from company to company. Some are going to be focused on certain priorities, depending on what they're trying to accomplish as an organization or depending on where their biggest pains are. A lot of times, a lot of the companies we work with, I'd say most of the companies we work with are companies that implemented some sort of technology, say 20 years ago. And not only is the technology outdated, it's not just a matter of the fact that they haven't upgraded the technology or they're not taking advantage of new technology. But what's even more common is they're using this old technology that has that they've outgrown. The business has changed and the technology hasn't changed to match the needs of the company. And so they end up reaching some sort of strain or tipping point where they've gone out and acquired companies, they've grown, they've they've had employees come and go, and they've just changed as a business over 20 years, but their technology hasn't. And so there's a strain and sort of a, a tipping point that companies oftentimes reach where they say, you know, we can't continue to grow this way and we need to figure out how to replace our systems. And unfortunately, most companies wait until probably too long. They probably wait until they feel some sort of pressure or pain that they just can't grow without uh, getting past. And so that makes the change even more difficult because they've waited so long and now it's a big, you know, 20 year jump instead of say a 10 year jump where if they just would have kept technology current to and aligned with the business, it, it wouldn't be quite as, as traumatic for them. So that's really the definition of digital transformation in my mind is just any sort of technology, whether it's anything you read about with artificial intelligence or blockchain, anything with analytics, ERP, HCM, CRM, all that stuff. So any sort of technology that allows a business to automate is the way I define digital transformation, which would include ERP and all the other things we talked about. Historically, so when I started my career, it was in the mid nineties, I guess it was. And uh, that's showing my age. And a lot of you are probably not even born when I started my career, which is disturbing for me to think about now that I'm saying that. Now, but <laughs> but uh, so the, uh, so I started in the mid nineties, I think in 97 is when I started my career at that internship. And then 98, I started it at Pricewaterhouse. And we would just do a lot of what we were doing back then was sort of replacing ERP systems is replacing one old ERP system for a new one. And it was just sort of a, I don't want to say it was, a, it was an easy change, but it was more of an upgrade of technology and you were just kind of shifting out technology and putting in new technology uh, to form the backbone of your business. And a lot of companies still do that today. They're looking for more incremental changes to their business. But the problem and opportunity at the same time is that there's so many new technologies that are just totally different, like transformative type of technologies like artificial intelligence is probably the, the best one I can think of where you're taking data, you're taking historic stuff and you're taking outside data points and you're putting it all together to create some sort of 
automation of picking up on patterns and predicting what might happen in the future. And that technology technology just didn't exist or it, it wasn't widespread, say 10 or definitely 20 years ago. And so now you're talking about these big massive changes and these big leaps from where companies are today to where technology could take them. And so those standard ERP implementations used to be where they used to be more incremental, um, not low risk, but there was there wasn't as much risk as there is now with digital transformation just because those those changes are so big. And so when we think about how are we going to help a client through that journey or how, what would you recommend any sort of company that's going to go through that journey? We'll typically focus on different areas. We'll focus on the, the technology, you know, the differences in terms of how technology can enable uh, improvements. We look at business process management differently. So, you know, for example, with, with traditional ERP upgrades, we're putting in new technology and we're, we're just tweaking our business processes to modify them slightly. Whereas with new technology and digital transformation, usually it's more of a complete overhaul of the way business processes work. So again, that's that's big opportunity. That could be a big ROI, but it's also bigger risk. And that's what companies don't account for is that that's a bigger risk than it was 20 years ago. From a change management perspective, I talked a bit about that, about how if you automate my job, I'm, I don't understand what I'm going to do now that you're, you're automating, say, 30 or 40% of my job. Not only am I nervous, but I'm confused. I don't understand how I'm going to fill my time. And by the way, I took pride in the fact that I did all this work for the last 20 years using my brain and you know, manually doing whatever process I did, even no matter how painful it might have been, I took pride in that. And now you're taking it away from me by putting technology into automated. So if you think about that from your perspective, if you're walking into a situation like that and, and multiply that by however many hundreds or thousands of employees that a company may have, you can see how that, that could create um, alarm within, within an organization. Eric, do you, have you had a company where you've gone in and there's only a few people that know the technology or, you know, have kind of taken it all themselves? And so do you ever run into situations like that? Does that make sense? Where there's a very few people that are involved with the decision or actually have the knowledge and they don't want to give it up or they don't, does that make sense? Yeah. It's uh, within any given company, it's rare, but you, you could have one or two people that that can be one, one or two people can be highly disruptive in that way. Because if they're the only ones that know, you know, we call it tribal knowledge. If they're the only ones that have that knowledge in their heads and no one else really knows how that process works or what's going to happen or, you know, what, what technology could do to help that process, it, that can be very difficult to crack the code on how we can use technology to make that better. I got you. Um, the other part of it too is it's not just what a company is doing today, but if you think about putting in a new technology, so we've decided we're going to pick these technologies over here and we're going to implement it over the course of however many years. Um, what ends up happening is the company that's implementing usually doesn't know anything about that technology. So they rely on the outside consultants to come in, the technical consultants to come in and help them design the software, or implement it. And it, it creates a lot of times this unhealthy relationship where it's kind of like we're blind because we just don't know the software. So we're just going to defer to the outside consultants. And so the outside consultants end up owning the project. And sometimes they rack up the bills and take longer than they should. And companies end up paying a lot of money for that. And that's where a lot of failures get into trouble is because uh, they depend too much on outside consultants. And there's ways we help clients kind of build the competencies in-house so that you're not, you know, uh, flying blind, relying on some outside consultant to help you through the entire process. Um, so that's the other part of it, is building the knowledge, not just of how things work today and dispersing that knowledge, but also building the knowledge that's going to help with the future state of the technology as well. You know, the, the message here, it's more complex. It can deliver more value, but it can also take more time, more cost. It's more disruptive to people. It's more disruptive to operations. But once you get past it, there's a huge ROI potential there. You know, once you can get past the, the pitfalls and the pains and provided you can actually get through it and, and stomach the pain that comes along with that, organizations that get to the other side will experience a positive ROI typically. There's some uh, pretty significant benefits that come from implementing new technology. I talked about the pitfalls. If they can get past the pitfalls, these are the, these are the top five things that CIOs and executives that have been through these sorts of projects, these are the things that they cite most commonly as the biggest problems they faced in their transformations. And you can see that number five is, is data. You know, so I'll kind of go in reverse order here real quickly, but data in getting your, all the data you've accumulated over the years, whether it's in an old ERP system or whether it's in spreadsheets or 
whatever, pen and paper. Sometimes there's still companies out there that track a lot of stuff in, in pen and paper. We've got to figure out how do we take all that data and put it into the new system so you don't lose track of your customers and your products and your financials and all the stuff you need to run your business. That data has to come over. And it's unfortunately, there hasn't been a super slick way to automate that process. You still have to clean up the data because most companies have a lot of what they call dirty data, stuff that's just been corrupted because people have not kept good track of it or it's just over the years, no one's really stayed on top of keeping it clean. So you've got to clean it up, but then we also have to map that data to the new system. Um, you just little things like, uh, without getting too technical, um, so for example, some systems will call a work order, like a manufacturing company that has a work order that says this customer wants this product, so we're gonna go build it on the shop floor. Um, that, that might be called a work order in some systems. Other systems, it might be called a service order. So when we track that, map that data, we've got to map the old service orders or the old work orders to the new service orders, just as one, one example. We need to map all the fields from the old system to the new one. And uh, that, that's hard for a lot of companies just to kind of migrate all the masses of data that they've captured over decades you know, into the new system. So data migration is, is number five, most common uh, challenge or pain point. Number four is clarity of business processes. A lot of times companies think, well, you know, I'm just going to put in new technology and the technology is going to drive my business for me, or it's going to define for me how I'm going to run my business. And that's just not true. Or most technologies today are very flexible and you can configure them and set them up a number of different ways. So you want to have a clear uh, blueprint, if you will, business blueprint for what you want to be when you grow up and what you want the technology to do so that you can go out and find the best technology and implement it in a way that supports those processes. Uh, if you don't do that, then what ends up happening is you get a bunch of consultants show up and they say, okay, tell us what you want the technology to do. And the client or the customer implementing will sit there and say, well, we don't know. You tell us, I mean, you, you know, the software, we don't know the software. And it turns into the circular reasoning that costs a lot of time and money and takes forever to get through. So the companies that are more successful, successful are the ones that define early on that this is how we would envision our processes working in the future. These are the things we'd automate. These are the pain points we'd get rid of, whatever it might be. And then there's a uh, difficulty managing the system integrator. Um, that's a term that I don't know if you all know or if any of you know, but typically uh, software vendors will have what they call systems integrators or implementation partners. And they're basically technical consultants that specialize in implementing whatever the technology is. So whereas we're independent, we, we aren't specialists in any one technology, but we're broad business consultants that help clients figure out the best technology and help them implement it. You still need that, that depth, like someone that knows that technology really well. But the problem is there's so much knowledge with those system integrators. It's almost like you don't, uh, you don't know how the sausage is made. You know, you're not, you're not part of the process of, designing and building the technology because you don't know it as a company, you're relying on that system integrator to do it for you. And it becomes very difficult to manage. They have ulterior motives first and foremost in that the longer it takes them to implement, the more hours it takes a consultant to implement technology for you, the more money they're going to make. So there's a, right away, there's an economic incentive that's a perverse incentive that is working against a company that is trying to implement it. So really managing and having controls around the system integrator and transparency into what that system integrator is doing is, is super important. And then another, the number two challenge is just having a implementation or transformation that's not aligned with what the, the company is trying to accomplish. So for example, there's certain technologies out there like uh, Microsoft is one you guys are probably familiar with in, in a variety of ways. So Microsoft makes an ERP system called Dynamics 365. And it's a, uh, you know, it integrates really closely with Microsoft Word and Outlook and some of the things you guys may be familiar with, some of the other Microsoft products you may be familiar with. But it, Dynamics 365 is one of the more flexible systems in the market, and which is great. You know, everyone wants flexibility or so they say. But then you get these big Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 companies that say, you know, we've gone out and acquired all these companies throughout the world and they're all operating independently. We're operating like 10 or 20 different companies. We want to start acting like one company. We want to centralize our sales department. We want to maybe centralize our HR department. We want to have a common way of delivering products or service to customers. We want to act like one company. So the customer experience ends up being consistent. The problem with Microsoft Dynamics 365 in this example is D365 is super flexible. It can do a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. 
And it gives companies a lot of rope to hang themselves to say, you could, you could still continue to operate as 10 or 20 different companies because our technology allows you to do that. But that may not be what you're trying to accomplish or what you really want to accomplish at the end of the day. So that misalignment between what the technology can or can't do and what you're trying to accomplish as a company is uh, very disruptive and can be very hard to succeed, if not impossible to, su to succeed when those two things aren't, aren't aligned, when you're not in sync with what you want to accomplish. And then the number one thing, hands down, that companies uh, struggle with and the thing that I would agree with and I think is, is the biggest, most important thing is just the people side of the transition. So back to Christy's point earlier about uh, the uh, training. Training is a big part of handling the people side of the transformation, but there's even more than that. There's communications on why we're making this change, how it's gonna help the company. There's redefining roles and responsibilities, making sure we have a clear definition of that person who now is automating their 30% of their job or whatever it is, what are they gonna do with the other 30% of their time? And that will help not only give better clarity to how to run the business better, but it'll also give clarity to the individuals in the company. It'll give them the comfort of knowing that, okay, we have a plan for my job. It's not just gonna go away. It's not gonna, uh, I'm not just gonna lose all that effort and that tribal knowledge I've contributed to the company over the years. So getting through that people piece of it is uh, very critical. And you can see that most of this, uh, other than data, is related to something other than the technology. So the technology isn't easy, but it's, technology is more black and white. Either it works or it doesn't. Either it integrates, you either successfully integrate from system A to system B or you don't. It's, it's pretty black and white. Whereas when you start talking about business processes and people and human behavior, that's not black or white. And that's where companies and technical consultants especially tend to really struggle because they can't, it's not as predictable as either a system works or it doesn't. One question I was kind of thinking, you know, as you're talking along and it all seems, you know, very technical. So what, what, ha, and, and I really love this part about, you know, not just how successful it is, but I like that you touch on the failures that you have as well. So that, that's just really interesting to me. But one thing, you know, I was thinking, how do you convince a small company that, or, you know, a Fortune 500 to spend the money on this? Because I'm sure the money, <laughs> I would just, you know, how, how do you go out at, at it that way? It's a great question. And uh, so the way we work with clients, a lot of times there's someone in the company and it's usually not, I don't want to say usually a lot of times it's not the, it's not an executive decision maker. Usually it's a layer below that'll reach out to us at first and say, Hey, I think we may need new technology. Could you help us? And, you know, so part of our, when we're first working with a client, part of our job is to figure out, well, how do you convince the executives that this project's even worth considering? And what, it, so what companies will do a lot of times is they'll do sort of an evaluation or assessment phase that says, we think we need a new system, but we're not quite sure. We don't know what the benefits are. We don't know what our options are. So maybe you guys, third stage, can just come in and assess our situation and help us figure out what types of technologies would best fit us, what would it cost realistically to implement it, what would the potential benefits be, and then ultimately what's that business case, the ROI analysis of the, the cost benefit. And so that's probably the best way is to say, yes, it's gonna cost you, you know, $5 million if you're a, a bigger, you know, midsize or bigger company. But if you can justify it by saying, but we think we'll get, you know, two to $3 million of annual benefits, you know, the payoff speaks for itself in that case. So it's being, it's being realistic and objective and quantitative about what the costs and what the benefits are and building out that business case. And that's a big part of how we help our clients. And there are times where it doesn't make sense to honestly, I mean, there's times where we go through these assessments and you say, look, the system you have, yes, yeah, 10 years old, um, Yes, it's not perfect. Yes, there's probably technology out there that might be incrementally better, but it's not worth spending $5 million to get, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of benefits per year. So in that case, we might say, well, let's focus on other lower cost, lower risk things that might deliver more, more value. So it's, it's really just a matter of dialing in what, what makes the most sense with what the company is trying to, trying to accomplish. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. Sure. It's, it's a lot easier when it's a company that's had the same system for like 20 or 30 years, because a lot of times it's just so outdated that it's, it's broken or it's about to break. And, and so to them, and this is another, maybe the flip side of this risk is they, they don't even care about the business case. They say, yeah, we don't care what it costs. We don't care about the ROI. We have to replace the system. And that's a pretty dangerous spot to be in because then you lose all your discipline and 
the costs spiral out of control and you spend way more than you should. So that's the, maybe the flip side of companies that aren't, they're more rushed because they've waited so long. Um, they, they tend to be the ones that run into the most trouble. Of course. Yeah. Have you ever dealt with a company that you thought you were just surprised that they didn't have it together more? Like you were maybe a fortune 500 or a thousand company that you were just sort of surprised that they were in such disarray maybe. Yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised how many companies, you know, and not fortune 500 necessarily, but mm -hmm. bigger, you know, say mid-sized companies that grew from zero to a couple hundred million in revenue per year. And they did it with spreadsheets or they did it just with something real basic like QuickBooks for accounting and they're running everything super manual. And you think, wow, how did you, how did you become this successful as a company um, in your, you know, your redlining, you know, you, you clearly there's some stress cracks in their redlining and they can't scale to the next level, but they were able to get to that point. It is, it is pretty surprising. You also see a lot of, it's always amazing to me now how uh, there's, you know, I think, just when I think I'm old and compared to you guys, there's people out there that have been using systems for like 40 years, you know, since I was a, a kid and they've been on the same technology and it's super outdated and it's like foreign to me a lot of times just trying to understand what they're using today. And it's amazing. A lot of them are really big companies too. They've, they've just found a way to piecemeal. It work. Piecemeal. Yes. That's, that's the word I was thinking piecemeal it all together. Kind of. So talk about the, uh, talking about risk and, uh, you know, a lot of times when you get presentations about ERP or technology, again, a lot of the focus is on all the cool stuff it can do. But when you look at what companies struggle with, a little over half of them struggle with some sort of, not just the implementation itself. So there's two layers of risk. There's the, there's the risk of the implementation itself, taking too much time, taking too much money, being disruptive to people while you're implementing it. But then once you've implemented it, the risk there is that you implement it and what happens if it doesn't work? And what happens if it doesn't work is your business shuts down. And that's a really big risk that a lot of companies don't plan for. They don't think it's even a possibility. But if you think about it, if you, if all of a sudden you go live, you shut off your old system, turn on the new one. Now all of a sudden you can't close the books to know if you were profitable last month or last quarter, you can't track customer orders. You can't ship uh, customer products. Uh, your sales guys and gals can't document or track what it is they're selling. You can see how all those dollars can add up to be really significant. And over just over half of companies have some sort of material operational disruption at the time of their go live, not because the technology was broken or flawed, but because they just didn't implement it well. And they didn't plan for that, those risks. And what we found is that the, the companies that do experience it, those 51 to 54% can actually potentially triple, you know, 300% up to 300% of their initial implementation cost. They have the additional cost of losing sales, of losing orders, of not being able to just track their inventory or track their money. And that, that's a pretty dangerous spot to be in. One of my, when I started my first company, my first consulting company about 15 years ago, I was working with the CEO at this company who we had helped evaluate the technology. We were helping them implement it. We worked with them for about two years. And we had, we had recommended a couple of delays because the, the software had some some kinks in and things we had to uh, tailor for the specific client. Part of it was because the, the technology just wasn't built to do what the client needed to do. So we had to customize or change the software code. And so we had recommended a delay to a couple times saying, Hey, to get this right, you know, we need to make sure this is all working and we haven't fully tested the solution. And we had, we had recommended a delay twice. We recommended a third delay for an additional 30 days. And it was going to cost, this is a company that does that at the time did about a hundred million in revenue. And we were suggesting that it would cost them about 60,000, if I remember right, about $60,000 more to extend it for another 30 days, just to make sure we had time to test and work out all the kinks and everything. And I remember the CEO saying, you know what, that's, uh, I'm tired of the delays. We're, we spent too much on this. We're going live on the date we said, and we said, okay, here are the risks. Just so you're aware, these are the risks. We, you know, we might not be able to ship product. So let's create a contingency plan and back up. And he said, I don't care. We're going live. So we went live 30 days earlier than we had suggested and it, did, it didn't go well. And they, they had lost. So in, in exchange for not spending that $60,000 to extend the, the project, they ended up losing a close to $10 million in, in lost orders. So these are customers that just canceled their orders because they, they couldn't ship it. They couldn't track their inventory. They couldn't track, you know, that one little thing in an ERP system breaks, it can, it can affect the entire thing. 
And that was what we were warning against is we needed to work through those kinks and continue fixing things in that system. So it's just a, it's a, I use the term Hail Mary, go live. You never want to be in a Hail Mary situation where you just chuck it up there and see, you know, what, whether or not you're, someone's going to land with the ball. That's a pretty high risk way to treat it. So the cost of disruption is a lot higher than the, the risk and the cost of actually implementing the technology. So, um, but companies don't think that way. They just think technology is cool. Technology is going to automate my business and how hard can it be? And the reality is it, it can be pretty difficult and it can be pretty disruptive if, if you don't do it right. So, you know, some of the lessons I'll, I'll just run through briefly, the seven lessons that, and, I, and we've touched on some of these points already, and I want to make sure that we, we leave time for questions you all might have or additional discussion that we, we don't get to in these slides. Um, but the first lesson we share with clients is that failure can be avoided. It's not, it's not a matter of luck. It's not, um, there's not something magical that big companies with lots of money are doing differently than the small companies or vice versa. It's usually stuff that has little to do with the technology and more about how you're running and transforming the business and the people side of the equation. And when we look at um, all these expert witness projects that I was talking about in my introduction, all these massive failures, um, either that have hired us to be an expert witness, or in some cases, they haven't gotten to a lawsuit stage yet, but the project has failed or it's gone off the rails, and they'll ask us to come recover it. And one of the things we learn in those extreme failure examples is there's some pretty common patterns. I mean, it's not like, wow, this is totally different. And there's totally different things that this company is doing that's really gotten them off track. Usually you compare them to other failures we see and you see a lot of the same patterns. It's usually stuff that they underestimated related to the people uh, transition or related to the operational transition, or they didn't manage their system integrator or their outside consultants very well. They let the consultants manage them and dictate to them how much money and time it was going to take. So those are all common patterns. And so, and we'll talk about some of those other patterns here in a second, but the key here is that the failure can be avoided. It's not something that just happens, even though the failure rates are extremely high, it's not coincidental. It's not due to luck or bad luck. It's due to the things that a company does or doesn't do related to their projects. And again, part of the problem is this industry is so biased and, and I tend to have a, a somewhat of a jaded view just this is all I know. This is the only industry I've ever worked in is consulting. And consultants are pretty biased for the most part. I mean, they, they go in peddling their product and their technology, and it's all about the technology. And what we say is it's really not. I mean, the technology, yeah, you need it to work, and there's some risk there, but the real risk is going to be in stuff that's totally unrelated to that technology. The other is to have a real clear digital strategy of what it is you, you're trying to accomplish. Um, the worst digital strategy that we see, and it's probably the most common digital strategy we see, is companies that say we have to, we need to go through this project because we have to replace our old technology. The vendor is going to stop supporting it. Um, we're, we, there's no one out there in the world that knows how to run this technology anymore, so therefore we need a new technology. That may be true, but you need a much better reason than that to have a clear vision and direction uh, for the project. So you want to have a clear vision of you know, are we trying to drive efficiencies? Are we trying to lower our cost structure? Are we trying to use technology to help us sell more? Are we trying to use it to retain employees or to make employees more engaged and happier working here? What are the things we're trying to accomplish? Because that's gonna lead us to different answers in how we deploy technology in our business. And a lot of companies say, yeah, yeah, that stuff's all nice. We just need to replace our systems. And that's a big red flag because you're, you're gonna wander aimlessly in your in your project if you don't have a clear vision of what it is you're trying to accomplish and also what the the business benefits are that you're trying to accomplish because you you need to know if i spend a million dollars on this technology what does it give me does it give me something that helps me accomplish my strategic objectives or am i just going to be on the bleeding edge of technology using artificial intelligence just just because you know it sounds cool but is it really delivering an roi so that's the kind of uh, focus that companies need is to have that clear strategy that, that guides their, their entire project. The business should really drive the technology, not the other way around. I equate it to the tail wagging the dog. If, if you let the technology drive your business, that's, that's the wrong way. Um, really the business needs to run it and, and it can be uh, tempting for business leaders to defer to their IT group and say, just fix it, just put in new technology. How hard can it be? It's just like deploying new laptops to people. I mean. That's what IT does, right? And, and it's not, it's, it's a lot more than that because we're talking about how we're gonna change our entire business. What are our processes gonna look like? And what are people's roles gonna be? 
all that stuff, that should be driving and dictating how technology is being used, not, not the other way around. And then uh, another interesting thing we haven't talked about, uh, this is a really big point, is that if, if you look at a lot of what we're talking about are maybe some common patterns and symptoms you see in failures. But if you peel back the onion and really look at what's the real root cause or what, what's one of the two real root causes, um, realistic expectations is one of them, or unrealistic expectations, I should say, is, is a cause of failure. So what I mean by that is a company goes to a software vendor and says, hey, I want to buy your technology and I want to implement it for my business. Uh, or I'm, I'm considering it, and, but I'm considering you along with, you know, two or three other systems out there. You deal with the sales rep from the software vendor, sales rep comes in and, and downplays the risk, downplays the cost and effort it's going to take you. They oversell the benefits and when, not knowing that it's oversold or that's misstated, you as a buyer say, hey, that sounds great. That's a great ROI. It's a no-brainer. I'm going to buy your software. I go, to, I go to get approval from the CEO and from the board of directors and I say, the sales rep says it's gonna take me a year and cost me a million dollars. But the problem is that's probably not right. It's probably gonna take you two years and cost you $2 million or you know, whatever the numbers are. But the sales rep isn't incentivized to be realistic with you because they wanna sell you software. So what ends up happening is I already sold my internal team on it costing a million dollars over the course of a year. But I quickly realized halfway through the project, there's no way we're finishing this in a year. And there's no way we're finishing for a million dollars. But by then, usually it's too late. You might be able to get more money from your management team or your board. But chances are they're going to tighten down the, the clamps and say, uh, we need you to figure out how to get this done in the original time and budget estimate. And so you end up making a bunch of bad decisions as a result. You cut all the things that are super important to success, things like change management. You cut time spent on defining your business processes. You might even cut things like testing, just basic testing of the technology, just because you're, you're kind of forcing, you're forcing a timeline and a budget that was never realistic to begin with. And so if a company did one thing and just started with realistic expectations and said, okay, it's not going to cost me a million in a year, it's going to be 2 million in two years. That's a huge deal because now we've, we, we don't need to cut corners on things. And, and granted, yes, it may mean that that software vendor may lose the deal as a result. It may mean that the, project may not get approval internally, but at least we had realistic expectations. At least we go in with our eyes wide open and we can look at other options if that if that's not the right option for, for the company. So those realistic expectations, I would say, is one of two root causes of, of a lot of the other things we're talking about. The other one is, is misalignment or misaligned, um, misalignment between the, the technology initiative and the overall strategy of the company. I'd say those are the two deep, deep root causes that lead to a bunch of other symptoms that, that we've talked about so far. Another challenge that uh, we see a lot of times with clients is that they, they spend a lot of time evaluating systems and technologies, looking for that perfect answer, that perfect fit, the thing that's kind of that silver bullet that does everything they want it to do. And unfortunately, that technology doesn't exist. There's a lot of great technology out there, but every company is so different and diverse. And the bigger the company, the more complex it is, the more diverse it is, the more likely it is you're not going to find technology that perfectly fits what your needs are. And so at some point you have to bite the bullet and say, okay, you know, we've done an assessment. We've been objective in our assessment of technology. We've identified, you know, this one or two or three technologies, whatever it is that we think are the best fit. It's not perfect, but you know, let's not overanalyze it and, and get caught up in analysis paralysis. Let's make a decision and let's move forward and start implementing it because implementing it is going to ultimately determine how successful we are. If we can implement successfully, and so every hour and dollar that's spent on evaluating software and trying to find the perfect software is another hour and dollar that you could be spending on instead just implementing it really well. And I always tell clients it's better to have an imperfect technology that may, you're not 100% sure is the, is the ideal situation compared to other systems out there. But if you're pretty close, there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns there where you don't want to continue analyzing and just you know, looking at every system out there, because there's hundreds of ERP systems in the market. There's no way to evaluate all of them. But if you have someone like our team that knows all the systems out there, you can quickly get to a decision so you can spend more time and money on the implementation. And so uh, that's another lesson is really just making sure you, you don't burn up too many resources with resources being limited in most companies. You don't want to burn up those resources during the evaluation. You want to invest more of it in the actual implementation to make sure that part goes well. And again, you have, you know, selection consultants, like consultants that come in and help clients select software. There can be an incentive to where the longer it takes them, 
the, the more money they make. And so they're going to want to overanalyze things for you and that sort of thing. So we actually use technology and we're trying to, uh, in some ways, we're trying to almost uh, destroy that service offering internally amongst us because we feel like the more, the quicker we can get a client to an implementation, the, the more successful they're going to be. But we have plenty of you know, revenue we can generate as a consulting company on the implementation side. Um, so we actually have technology that, that automates a lot of the decision-making process to provide data to help clients make those decisions faster. Um, even though, you know, a lot of our services are based on software evaluations, we're trying to minimize that and spend, you know, get our clients to spend more on the implementation because that's where they're going to be successful. Um, there are no silver bullets. That's another eye-opening thing for a lot of executives, especially, especially CIOs that are super well-educated and sophisticated and understanding all the different technologies out there. A lot of them will get caught up in industry hype and trends and um, industry analysts out there, which by the way, industry analysts are also extremely biased because the software vendors hire industry analysts to put out reports about how great technology is. So industry analysts are out there talking about all these silver bullets, all these great new advancements in technology and really hyping up and overstating the benefits of technology, mainly because their customers are the, the software vendors who are paying them to create that, that hype. Um, even not to go off too much of a tangent here, but even if you look at uh, blogs and the media, um, software vendors will actually commission articles about their technology that then gets published in different blogs and media outlets. So there's just a lot of money spent by software vendors really controlling the narrative and controlling the marketing spin. And so you really have to cut through that and recognize, okay, that stuff may be true. There's some great benefits, some great technology out there, but none of this is, a, is an easy answer. There's no easy button. There's no silver bullet that just is going to make this easy for me. I still have to go through the hard work of transforming my business. That's ultimately what I'm doing at the end of the day. The seventh uh, lesson here and the second to last, because there's a bonus uh, lesson here that we threw in, is uh, to take your time and control the, the project tempo. So what I mean by that is, you know, on one hand, you don't want these projects to take too long, but you also don't want to rush them. If you rush the projects, you're going you're gonna to gloss over a lot of really important things that get you quicker to a failure. So that's a lot of times what ed companies end up doing is, yeah, we saved a bunch of time and money implementing really fast, but it just got us to a failure faster. So we, which is a lot more expensive than just spending the time and money to get the implementation right in the first place. And again, looking at biases and human behavior, why do companies do this? A lot of it's because the software vendors are heavily incentivized to sell as much software as they can as quickly as they can because they make more money faster. So their natural recommendation is going to be, do this as quickly as possible, buy as much software as possible, and you'll be on the other side realizing all these great benefits if you do that. And the reality is it's, you know, it's usually takes longer, takes more time and money than most, most organizations think. So we always tell clients to take control and control the tempo, control the pace of the game and really do what's right for you as a company, not necessarily what the software vendors are trying to sell you. And then finally, the most important thing, like we mentioned before is change management that that people side is really the most important. Um, and I think this is becoming more and more true over time. I'd say in the last, five years, this has become increasingly true. Um, I've always thought it's the number one thing on the list, uh, partly because I started my career as a change management consultant. So it's, it's kind of an area that's near and dear to my heart. But even setting that aside, you look at all these uh, pains that people go through when they're going through these transformations and the, the turmoil it causes. It's not just about you know, not, you know, it's not just about feeling bad for people because it's stressful going through these changes. That's part of it. But the even bigger problem is it's just so disruptive to a company. I mean, you companies just end up creating so much chaos and disruption and turmoil that they don't need to if they just focus on the people side of it and keep, you know, get people calm by educating them, helping them understand the changes, helping them be part of the changes, helping them see what their new jobs are going to look like, what the opportunities are for them in this new world. You know, if you automate this big part of my job, I feel a sense of loss. But if I can replace it with, wow, I get to learn some new technology and suddenly I'm much more marketable than I was before. That's enough to get a lot of people excited and say, okay, I, I can make that trade off. Now I see where I could benefit from this. But the problem is most companies don't take the time to do that. So all the, all the employees see is what they're losing and they're losing what they spent years or decades in some cases doing to perfect their jobs. And now you're, you're disrupting their entire world. 
So companies that get this right, generally, you know, I'll bet money on them succeeding. If this is all they did right and they kind of screwed up some of the technology stuff or didn't get the operational stuff quite right, but they did this really well, I'm going to bet on that company being successful or at least being more successful than most, most companies out there. On the flip side, the company that doesn't do this well, I will bet every time that they're going to fail because they will. And the companies that don't do this stuff well, they, they will fail no matter how well they uh, deploy the, the technology, no matter how well, even if they've defined their business processes perfectly and the technology is a perfect fit, it's all been tested, it, it's a great match for what the company is trying to do strategically. If you miss this last part, it, none of that stuff matters because it's going to fail. And so that's the, not the irony, but the, the interesting thing is it really doesn't take a whole lot of extra time and money to do this stuff. It's a lot of little things, but so many companies just, just forget these little things. It's, it still fascinates me that 20 years in, you know, after doing this, so, you know, however many years I've been doing it, 23 years, so many companies are making the same mistakes now as they were when I first started my career. So it's, it's so on one hand, technology is changing dramatically, it's improving dramatically, but the ways companies implement and adapt to technology hasn't changed much. And I think that's a big, a big problem in the industry. So that is what I've got. So that's a kind of a high, I'm, it's meant to be a, a high level flyover of what successful companies do differently than those that fail and vice versa. Um, so I'll stop there and, and see what, what questions you guys have. What, what didn't we cover that you want to talk about or what, what, uh, what didn't make sense or what do you want to dive into? It might be more helpful. One, I mean, I have a lot of students in this class and um, 170 on right now. And all of these students are going to go in a lot of different directions. And so, it, and I loved your presentation and I loved the last part. I thought that was so interesting, but you know, I'm going to have a lot of students go in a lot of different directions. And I think, although they think that they, this might not um, affect them in any way, I think it totally will in some way, at some point in their life. And, you know, what, what would you say you would be looking for if, a, or what, what direction should they take if this does interest them and kind of what would you be looking for in, you know, somebody that was looking for a job with your company or, you know, what are some of those characteristics or the degree you're looking for if this does kind of interest people? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll just speak for, for third stage and what I look for, which I think is different than what, what a lot of companies look for. And I'll try to answer what I think other companies look for because I, I used to work for some of those other companies. What I look for is, I, I mean, I look for more, I mean, tech, technical knowledge is, is great, but I look for people that have the, the softer skills or, you know, just good, you know, if I, if I sense from someone that they'd be good at understanding a business and strategy and the operational and organizational sides of things, then that, that to me is a lot more appealing than someone that knows a lot about technology. The technology stuff, we can teach that, you know, someone can learn that fairly quickly, but learning you know, I guess getting the raw skills of just learning how to analyze a business, um, how to listen and really, you know, cause we, we, we as consultants have to be kind of like chameleons. We have to, we have to look, go into different situations and read it differently just based on the client. And it's not just the type of company you're dealing with or the unique strategy of a company, but it's also the individual personalities, the human personalities. And so you have to be kind of a chameleon part therapist, part, you know, analyst that can analyze, business processes, and then yes, part technologist, that's another part of it. But I'd say technologist is probably the, the least important part. If I were answering this back from earlier in my career, before I started this company, when I was part of the, the machine, as I call it, part of the, you know, the typical consulting firms, I might flip that. I might say actually technology is more important. I need someone that can get their hands dirty and really understand how technology works because they're going to be in there configuring it and building it and that sort of thing. So, you know, if you, if you have an interest in technology and, and really building software and building code or, or uh, doing integration between systems, or maybe you want to be a CIO someday and you really want to focus on that, on that technical track, then I think those big consulting firms like where I started, the, those can be a great place to start. But if you think you want to be a consultant or, you know, maybe you want to be a CFO or a COO or maybe even a CEO, whatever it is, you want to be more on the business side, then I'd say, you know, the, the answer I gave for what, what we look for might be more, more intriguing. So I think you just first wanted to find kind of what is that path you want to go down, which makes the most sense to you. And then, uh, you know, and then figure out, you know, build your skills accordingly. Okay. I do have a couple questions. Um, 
One is how do you keep your company and teams updated with the new technologies and trends that are coming out that you could offer your clients? Is it often that clients will introduce your company to new technologies? It's a great question. Um, so the way we keep uh, our team educated is, is first of all, we, we work with a lot of the, most of the big software companies will have partner groups that will, they're meant to, basically their, their job is to educate and market to uh, consulting firms and analysts. So they, they'll usually, you know, their job is really to get you to be a pro, you know, really understand the benefits of their technology. So their job is to try and you know, kind of flip you a little bit, you know, in, in our case, they're trying to flip us to say, hey, our, we're the best out there, don't you see? And you should be recommending us a lot more to your clients. And so you go with a grain of salt and say, yeah, that's, that's what you're all saying. But in the process, you know, you learn a lot about the technology just by having them give us briefings on how their technology is changing. And um, with cloud solutions, the technology is changing extremely rapidly and there's no way for any one person to stay on top of every system out there and how, you know, what changes they're making. So those briefings can be very important and very helpful, but they're biased. You know, it's a sales spin, it's a marketing spin that we're getting. So we, we augment that typically with the database we have that tracks quantitatively how different systems compare to one another in different functional areas. And that technology is probably the best way because I, I go into that and I see stuff that I didn't know about technologies all the time. And I don't know that I'll ever, no matter how long I do this, I don't think I'll fully have all the answers. Um, or once I think I'm getting close, something's going to change and suddenly I don't have all the answers. So that's the thing I think you have to be most prepared for is just keeping up with this stuff because it, it is a lot to think about. It's a lot to keep up with. And we're not perfect at it by any means, but I think we've done a good job of building the tools and the processes to get us as educated as we can. And then we also work as a team. So it's usually not like one person, myself included, no one person would go into a client and make all these recommendations without working as a team and collaborating and, you know, getting the collective knowledge behind whatever those recommendations are. Okay. How long does it take to determine if the software you are implementing to a new company isn't going to fit after the initial analysis? That's a really interesting question. The sooner the better, I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, ideally, I mean, in a perfect world, you should be able to draw that out in the analysis. I mean, you should be able to flush that out in the evaluation phase, but if for some reason there's some major oversight or a lot of times what happens in, in cases we see is the company selects a software, we make a recommendation based on where the company is today and where they think they're headed. And in the middle of the implementation, they go out and acquire some big company and all of a sudden they they're diversify their business. Now they're in a whole new market, a whole new product category and that technology wasn't built for that. So that's where we see it the most is something changes pretty disruptively, uh, if that's a word, disruptively, uh, on the uh, business side of things that make the technology more obsolete. But if, you know, normally if it's a company that's just steady eddy, it's kind of moving along at a, at a current trajectory, we'll be able to flush that stuff out in the evaluation stage so that we hone in on the ones that aren't going to have that problem. Okay. Interesting. As more of a consulting firm with technology, have you ever found a need to update your own technology in the company? If you have, was it a similar process to the companies you consult? Well, uh, yes, we've, we've been exposed. Whoever asked that question <laughs> exposed us as a company. We, uh, so we've been <laughs> for two and a half years now. It's been two and a half years since a group of us left our previous company to start this one. And we're still using QuickBooks. We have a spreadsheet we use to forecast all of our projects and how we're going to staff them with people and the hours we're going to allocate to them and we are in need of an ERP system. So we're getting to that point where I'd say probably next year, we're probably gonna, in 2021, we'll probably end up needing to take a dose of our own medicine and there figure you out go. how technology can help us. Interesting, okay, I have one more question. When did you feel that you had ample resources and connections to branch out on your own? And what was that pushing point? It's a good question. I honestly, when I was, I, I mean, I had always had this idea for an independent consulting firm back when I first started, because I felt like it just felt kind of weird throughout my career. I felt like, why are we, why are we recommending this? Why are we doing this? Why don't we look at other options? But we couldn't because we represented or were partnering with a technology vendor. So we kind of had to toe the company line, but it deep down, you kind of knew it was just weird. And so I always had this idea, like, well, there's got to be someone out there that's independent. That's not, you know, in, in bed with the, the software vendors. It turns out that there really wasn't anyone. So in 2005, I was 32 and, um, I honestly, I just, the boss I was working for is driving me crazy. And I was just like, you know what, I've been wanting to start this company. He's, he's 
driving me crazy. Uh, maybe now's a good time to do it. And so I just went out and tried it in 2005. And honestly, I, I probably did too soon. I wasn't quite ready to, I mean, I was ready, but I, I, there's a lot I didn't know that I didn't realize at the time that I, you know, having done it again now a third stage, I feel like I can learn from a lot of those lessons and, and do things better. So I, I feel like I had the resources. I mean, I had the knowledge, I feel like of the, of the industry as far as the consulting part of it, but I just didn't, as far as being a leader and building a culture and knowing how to find the right people to reflect me and what I wanted the company to become, I didn't do that stuff very well. So on one hand, I, yes, I was ready. I felt like I'd been doing it for 10 years. I had the technical functional capabilities, but what I was missing at that age was the, uh, the subtle, the more subtle parts, but really important parts of growing a company, which is you have to build a really cool culture if you want, you know, the company to grow and succeed and you want the company you know, we have 30 people now and I need those 30 people not to be just like me, but I need to feel comfortable with any one of those 30 people. I can put them in front of a client and feel like it's not going to be a huge drop from me down to that person. And what I was doing before is I was just hiring really smart people at my previous company, but I didn't really pay attention to, you know, are they a good cultural fit? Are they, are, is it someone I just, I want to be around? It's sometimes as simple as that. If, if you, uh, mm -hmm. you just want to know that if you get stuck in an airport traveling as, or back before COVID, we used to travel all the time. It seems like forever ago, but um, I, used, I, used, I always used to ask when I would interview someone, I'd always think to myself, imagine getting stuck at an airport and I'm stuck at a bar at the airport with this guy or gal. Could I see myself talking to this person for four hours while we're waiting for our flight? And if the answer is no, then I shouldn't hire that person. Not because I, you know, I want to be an a-hole or anything, but because it just needs, you need to create that culture of that tight knit culture. And I didn't pay attention to that in my first company. So I guess it's a two-part answer. There was stuff I was ready for, there's stuff I wasn't ready for at that age. And I don't know if I, honestly, I don't know if I would have done it any differently. I, I did make a lot of mistakes in that first uh, pass through, but um, I don't know. It's kind of fun to make mistakes and learn from them. And see there the you are. Next time. And he, yet here you are. So you're doing something right. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much. I, I mean, that was super informative. I, I learned a lot. I know everybody else did as well. And thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I think our class is about to wrap up. So one, one thing I'd say just as a closing is, is if you guys ever want, um, you know, any sort of advice, I, I may be slow to respond, but I'm happy to, you know, if you want to reach out to me for advice or whatever, I'm happy to do that. If it's career advice or just how to learn more about this stuff, feel free to reach out to me. And also, you know, another easy way to just learn more, would be to follow me on, on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're not, I, I strongly suggest you get on LinkedIn because it's a great networking tool. Uh, but you'd follow me on there and I post stuff every day. There's stuff that our team posts on my behalf, just lessons and content and things that you, you could learn a lot from. And uh, you can also follow my YouTube channel as well, where I post videos twice a week out there on, on YouTube. Oh, you're busy. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate this and I'm sure they do too. I'm getting a lot of thank yous on the chat. So Wow. Okay. Well, that is, I guess, all I have for today. I appreciate it, Eric. Thanks all right. A lot. Thank you all. all right. Thank all right. you very much. Okay. You Take care. Bye. Bye.